Our next speaker is Mr. Kurt Baumgartner. He serves as Senior Security Researcher, Global Research and Analysis Team, Kaspers Kaspersky Labs. Mr. Baumgartner joined Kaspersky Lab in 2010 and is responsible for monitoring the malware landscape across the Americas and enhancing Kaspersky Lab technologies and solutions. Previously, he was Vice President of Behavioral Threat Research at Symantec, PC Tools Threatfire, Chief Threat Officer at Novatix, and a Threat Analyst at SonicWall. Over to you, Kurt. All right, thank you. Um, where are my slides? There we are. All right, welcome. I want to take a few minutes today to take a look at targeted attacks, uh, the risk they pose, um, how that may or may not have changed since the advent of Stuxnet, and, uh, and how we can move forward with some of that. Um, I am a global research and analysis team member at Kaspersky Labs, and uh, we've done quite a, we have a team around the world um, working on targeted attacks and uh, as they happen. I'm a part of that team. So I wanted to take a look at targeted attacks and I started looking at the mass of stuff that I'm seeing in Q1 2013. So I picked out a few that I could fit in 15 minutes and uh, the, the targeted attacks that we're going to look at here really have more to do with the traditional um, theft of, of commercial IP, um, of cyber espionage and cyber surveillance of individuals. Um, in uh, January of this year, we started off the year with Red October. And Red October was a large-scale, multi-year multi cyber espionage effort that successfully infiltrated um, uh, diplomatic, governmental, scientific institutions around the world. Um, the, the operation itself um, uh, let's see here. Sorry about the map being a little small. Um, the operation itself um, lasted at least five years. Um, it targeted, like I said, military, aerospace, government, scientific institutions, and um, these attacks continued. Um, and as they continued, the attackers developed uh, spyware and their tool set for mobile networks, for network devices. They built it out as they went. Another interesting uh, set of attacks that we've been watching, um, we called MiniDuke. Um, MiniDuke re-implemented the Adobe Reader uh, 11 sandbox evasion technique. And they sent Spearfish out to victims. Uh, we found at least 59 um, successful infiltrations um, in at least 29 countries. Uh, they were also after governmental, scientific, um, all sorts of research institutions. Um, and some of what we found about these guys was a little more, um, a little more concerning than usual. Uh, they were very creative, so they were using Twitter and Google for their C2 uh, infrastructure, which makes it uh, a little harder to track, a little harder to identify and find suspicious on the wire. Um, they were also using uh, steganography, so they'd update their files, uh, they'd include embedded encrypted executables in GIF files that were directed to by the communications that were encoded in tweets that they had planted on the web uh, on Twitter uh, months if not a year prior. Um, so this was a pretty well coordinated effort and another interesting thing about it is that um, it was carried, the code we analyzed was written in assembly. We don't see that a whole lot anymore. And the techniques they used were also very interesting and indicative of sort of older veteran virus writers that we'd seen in the past. And one of the interesting signatures within the binaries that we found was the mark of the beast, as they used to put it. And the group itself was called 29A, and 29A is actually hexadecimal for 666. Um, so we thought we saw the return of one of the most creative, innovative um, virus writing groups uh, only applying their skills to much more sensitive networks. And then thirdly, we found uh, a Tibetan activist, uh, his account hacked and used to attack uh, Uyghurs, Uyghurs um, that attended the World Uyghur, uh, Uyghur Congress in early March. 
So we're seeing a lot of interesting things here. One novel thing that we hadn't seen before was the use of an Android backdoor in this way. Um, that was used in this way. They actually developed an Android backdoor that was sent out as a part of the Spearfish. So in this email that you see at the very bottom, there's an APK file that if you were to attend this conference, for example, and somebody was telling you, go ahead and install this, this is the conference agenda, this is what you'd end up with on your Android. Um, and, and the backdoor would steal contact lists, so we, lot, we saw a lot of cross-group trust being violated here, and uh, just some interesting technical stuff that was going into these newer attacks. So here are a few more details that sort of relate a little better to uh, Stuxnet and reviewing targeted attacks in light of sort of the Stuxnet Big Bang. Um, Agent BTZ, I'm sure a few people in the room are familiar with that. It infiltrated Pentagon networks in 2008. Um, we uncovered in January this Red October cyber espionage campaign, and there are some comparisons to be made here between the two. Um, ThumbDD was copied to this OCX file by agent.btz when it was stealing um, data off of systems. If you look a little further down, there's a log file, and there are it, there's a high level of technical detail, um, along with system timestamps and dates. If you look to the right, that SA equals MS sys MGR dot OCX, that's the code that we found in the USB stealer um, for Red October. So um, uh, clearly the two are have some level of similarity here. When you look just below the, the on the right, um, there is a Red October log, and it contains the same level of highly technical detail that you'd find in the agent.btz incident or code. Um, so a lot of what we saw earlier infecting and infiltrating sensitive networks, even here, um, we're seeing again uh, in 2013. Um, comments and a the APT uh, have been um, infiltrating systems and in probably the most relevant has to do with Telvant. So that's a Canadian, uh, op Canadian services corporation that basically helps operate more than half of the oil and gas pipelines uh, within North America and Latin America. Um, further down on that list, uh, there's been quite a bit of disruptive activity in South Korea, uh, which is of interest. I don't call it destructive because they were able to recover it from it fairly quickly. Um, but when you are talking about destructive targeted attacks um, that are very recent, I'd say Shamoon tops the list. Uh, take, coming back from that attack uh, was a major effort. So the quintessential Stuxnet um, characteristics are that it was an ICS rootkit. The guys operating the plant had no idea of what was going on. Um, also interesting is that there were over 100,000, I shouldn't have used the word incidents, there were at least 100,000 uh, collateral infections around the world. And what's interesting about that is um, the, uh, the worm itself, again, I mentioned earlier and I didn't finish my thought, that Sergei Ulyssin was the guy, the Belarusian, who identified this on the networks because of multiple BSODs. I asked him last week, w did you ever figure out what the BSODs uh, came from on those customer systems? And he said, no, it's still a mystery. But when you've got 100,000 infections around the world and we know that Stuxnet made its way into corporate organizations, you're running into stability issues and there's collateral damage there that's beyond an infection and you start moving into um, stability and performance issues within critical infrastructure. So um, in light of all this, uh, there's been quite a bit of discussion, I just heard it up here on the stage, about intrusion tolerance or different variants of intrusion tolerance. Now, these targeted attacks have been completely, well, I shouldn't say completely, they've been very effective. Even in Q1 of 2013, we're, we're exposing multi-year attacks that are making their way into nuclear research uh, organizations, into military installations, all sorts of organizations all over the world. Um, within critical infrastructure protection, um, it, this, is, this also relates, I guess, to the talk and the questions about secure OS. Where does it really belong and can you have a secure operating system to work with? Um, 
this is the prime place or the perfect place for it within critical infrastructure operations. And um, there's always the trade-off between robustness of systems and uh, full security. Um, but in my opinion, uh, intrusion tolerance really does not have a place within critical infrastructure and highly critical operations. Um, also within this discussion of Stuxnet and, um, and cyber weaponry, um, the, I mentioned Stuxnet as a big bang. Um, it really did, according to a number of uh, spokespeople on the issue, um, legitimize the use of cyber weapons and certainly the discussion is already here about how well it's being operated um, and will continue to be operated in the field. The unfortunate piece is in the commercial world, um, uh, a lot of budgets are also being slashed. So in the face of sequestration, in the face of um, uh, uh, the austerity measures in Europe that are going on on a global scale, how do you address uh, what needs to be re-implemented? We have critical infrastructure communications um, that we currently know about that are not authenticated. Um, within the grid, we know that there are um, network protocols that need to be rewritten. Um, so sort of a, an easy solution is not something that is available right now. Um, when I look at uh, the vulnerabilities within critical infrastructure, um, already this year, the US CERT issued 40 advisories. Um, and those advisories maintain multiple vulnerabilities or can maintain multiple vulnerabilities within each one. Um, so we know that the systems, even in Q1, that was just in Q1, are vulnerable. Um, it's, it's definitely something that needs to be addressed. Uh, PLCs, the ICS communications, I mentioned that. And then in light of these targeted attacks, we still maintain communications with back offices from plant floors. There, there's infrastructure that uh, simply needs to be reconfigured. Um, with these target attacks, like with Red October and with Mini Duke, um, sort of pivoting your way through an or organization is the name of the game. You don't go for your target, you go for the human resources person who is going to open your spearfish, and then you maneuver your way back in. Um, the same thing can go on within these infrastructure organizations. Uh, so it's very important that communications uh, become secured and that uh, secure OS, when people are bringing iPads on the floor and possibly Android devices on these plant floors, that they are fully secured. And then finally, uh, with all of this insecure, vulnerable stuff, how has this not turned into a major incident so far? Um, is it a lack of offensive security investment, which is probably not the case, um, because we know that Android has been, um, has been well-researched and exploit development has been carried forward with Android devices and other devices that can end up on infrastructure floors. Um, or is it the execution? And uh, as of right now, that's where um, the limitations seem to be. So uh, with that, um, uh, I, I will leave, yeah, I, I left a little bit of time for questions about critical infrastructure protection in the light of successful ongoing targeted attacks in Q1. All right. So we do have one question for you. Are there enough cyber professionals to adequately review infrastructure systems and defend against attacks like Stuxnet? Interesting. Uh, are there enough cyber professionals? Um, uh, the short answer is um, it depends what region you're talking about. So if, if you're looking at LATAM, if you're looking at some Brazil, if you're looking at some other areas of the world, um, there aren't always cybersecurity researchers available or the funding available to address it along with the urgency fully explained to the decision makers. So um, within the US, uh, I do think there 
there is a good number of cyber professionals that can handle the problem. Um, whether or not that's actually happening is a different matter. And we'll uh, go with one more from the audience. As the government increasingly uses commercial iOS and Android devices, what can agencies do to ensure their systems are more secure? All right. Uh, well, to start with Android, um, Android, because it's an open uh, system, it has gained a reputation um, of not necessarily being um, as secure as something that would be more difficult to reverse engineer. Um, but when you look at the vulnerabilities that have been exposed for rooting Android or for gaining root access on the device, um, almost all of them, probably 90%, I'm not positive about the number, 80, 90% of them have more to do with um, uh, code and configuration errors that manufacturers deliver on the device before they sell it. So it's not the Android platform necessarily, it's how it's configured and the drivers and functionality that's being added by the manufacturer. So um, certainly choosing a manufacturer that has has built security and can demonstra demon well, demonstrate that they've built security into the design and development of whatever it is they're trying to deliver is a good place to start. Um, pen testing would be something the manufacturing manufacturer needs to do against their, their own code, code audits. Um, those are all a good place to start. And this will be our, our last question. Is there area of cyber security research that people need to invest in? Hmm. A key area area of cyber security research <laughs> to invest in. Um, huh. There's a lot. <laughs> um, that's a big question. Uh, I think that the, you know, sort of the, the high risk organizations um, uh, have to do with critical infrastructure. And critical infrastructure um, and the owners want to move forward with robustness and functionality for, uh, for their own floors. Um, so certainly working with the necessity, the necessities of delivering mobile to critical infrastructure, the wireless um, environments that are being built and the protocols that are being used um, within critical infrastructure and how those devices are being introduced um, is, is probably a, a fruitful place to invest. All right. All right, thank you.